So there's some things to look out for on, on potential successes. Let's do another analysis. This one comes from Bill Gross of Idea Lab. And he looked at why startups succeeded. He said, what's the difference between the successes and the failures? Uh, he looked, this is a, a really good TED talk. It's, it's pretty short. And he looked at five different um, aspects of companies. Uh, he called his startup studio Idea Lab. It got started before the dot-com bubble. It's the most successful startup lab there is ever. And so he thought at the beginning that ideas were everything, you know, the most important thing. We hear from investors that it's team. When you talk to, when you go into an angel group or talk to a prolific in investor and you ask them what are the top three things to look for, they'll say it's team, team, and team. So we wanted to look at that. Is it business model? Was it sufficient funding? Was it timing? Like what are the other factors that make for successes? So he looked at 200 companies. 100 companies were uh, coming out of Idea Lab. And so some of them, you may or may not recognize the top ones. They're all billion dollar companies. They all succeeded. Uh, the, I think the biggest success on here was actually Overture. Overture got purchased by Yahoo. They were the inventors of pay-per-click. That's the model that Google uses to make all their money. Google saw Overture and they copied it and they got sued and there was a big settlement. So the Overture business model was by far like the best model of all time. Uh, Overture itself did just fine. We don't have to worry about Google making more money. Uh, the other ones were all big successes. The ones on the bottom, you probably never heard of because they were all failures. So he ranked these five things, uh, these five aspects on all these companies. And then he looked at a hundred others that were not out of Idea Lab. You should recognize all the ones at the top. Um, all of them either went public or got purchased on their way to going public. Uh, Instagram got purchased by uh, by Facebook for a billion dollars before they had a dime of revenue. YouTube got purchased by Google for $2 billion before they even had a business model. LinkedIn went public and is now part of Microsoft. And here's pets.com on the bottom. These are five really famous dot-com companies from the dot-com bubble. They all, you know, they all got to be household names for at least a week, if not one Super Bowl, and then fell apart. Uh, and so why? And so when he did his analysis, this is what he came up with. And I don't believe the numbers. So the way I'm going to interpret this is to say it's mostly about timing. It's you got to bring the right product to the right market at the right time. If you're too early, you're going to fail. If you're too late, you're too late. Other people are doing it. You're, you're going to fail. Timing is probably half of everything. 40, they said 42. But if you look back at the numbers, like there's no ones here. These are all failures, but the lowest number is three. Right? So I'm going to take it that, they're, that their ranking is off a little bit. And the timing is like half of everything. And team is only about a third, right? which was surprising. Yes, you have to have a good team. You have to be able to execute. But it's not the be all end all that the investors say it is. Idea is even less important. And the way he talks about this is that uh, you know, the right team finds the right idea, even if they didn't start there. Business model is even less important. You have to have one. You have to have one that works. But you'll find it if things are going well. And then you have to have the funding, but your funding is alone is insufficient. We learned that with WeWork and, and a lot of, there's this giant fund that SoftBank started, the, the Vision Fund. Uh, and most of the things that they put money in, they put it in on the thesis, the investment thesis that we can just buy the market. We can make this a success if we put enough billions of dollars behind it. Uh, and that's proven false. So I think, I think he's right here that funding is, is necessary, but not, not anywhere near sufficient. And so he summed it up and he talks about that. And so we'll use that framework going forward. And then on the flip side of that, going back to thinking about failures, what goes wrong, most companies fail. Most startups do not succeed. And there's a whole lot of analysis out there on the internet on why. Here's one, I'll just let you look at that, but here's one analysis that says why. And here's three more. And we're going to use the one on the right here from CB Insights. It's a company that tracks every VC investment that's made and every angel investment they can find. Most of, most of the investments in the U.S. are tracked by that. And I'm going to use the one in the middle just to talk about really what's, what's going on here, because uh, this one's prettier. Number one, you know, the company builds something, brings to market something that nobody wants to buy. Fundamentally, everything else on here except the, the hiring one, except number two, is based on bringing something to market that no one wants. So as Shala said, she hasn't invested in a company that's been what we would call a rocket ship yet. 
uh, rocket ship, which I got to be part of once one of my startups. Oh my God. All, there's no, pro the, the problems you have in running the companies, you can't hire fast enough. You can't fulfill the orders fast enough. There's too many people who want your product and you just can't get it out to them fast enough. When you have that as your major problem, everything else goes away. The money just shows up. The, the funding shows up. The, the talented team shows up. Everything shows up. It's just really stressful to, to grow that fast. Uh, I had one that was grown 3x year over year for like four years. We went from two of us to 105 in three years. It just felt like all we were doing was hiring people. Like every week it would be interview after interview because it takes four or five or six interviews to find the right person when you're on a rocket ship. And then, you know, you can make bad hiring decisions and the team can have issues, but usually the team gets along when the customers are there. So if you just look at this list here and I won't walk through them, everything else is just based basically on just not having product market fit, we would say, not having this issue that customers are just, you know, uh, flooding in your door. If we go back to those failures, the big famous dot-com failures, it certainly was, wasn't lack of money. <clears throat> so Webvan, it was a uh, home grocery shopping service. They raised and spent $400 million just to serve San Francisco. So they wrote a plan in the dot-com boom. It wasn't hard for them to raise the money. Money was flowing really fast then. They said online grocery sales were going to be huge. Month one, it was going to be 10,000 customers. So they literally sat around saying, oh, well, how are we going to serve 10,000 customers in day one or week one? And I'm like, well, we're going to need a lot of trucks. We're going to need a big warehouse. We got to fill 10,000 orders. Like we can't just hire humans for that. We got to automate the warehouse. So they spent money automating the warehouse. This is before open source software. They had to build everything from scratch, including the, the, the automation software and the website and everything else. They burned through $400 million. And not only did they not make a profit, I don't think they ever, ever had 10,000 customers. As compared to Amazon Fresh, which it's just a matter of timing. They were just too soon. Amazon Fresh comes along about, what, 10, 12 years later, and they built it off the back of an established logistics system that was already working for books and everything else. And they just had to tweak it to work for fresh food. And I believe Amazon Fresh is working. I haven't looked at the at the uh, annual reports to see if it is, but we know that Amazon kills things if they don't work, right? It's been so many years, this must be working. And Amazon Fresh runs in multiple cities and I'll bet you they didn't spend $400 million before they made a profit on it. Uh, another famous one back then, here's Mark Zuckerberg's profile on Friendster. Again, Friendster was not lacking in money. Friendster was, was a $50 million series of, of uh, fundraisers, right? 50 million in total backed by major VCs in California, looked like a giant success, lost to, lost to MySpace, didn't lose to Facebook, lost to MySpace. MySpace then lost to Facebook. Why? Yes, there was a better product, but mostly it was a, it was a, piece, of, um, uh, a piece of analysis that we call the network effect. So if you were to try and join Friendster when it was a big thing, Probably you didn't know anyone there. Look, Mark only had 20 friends. Maybe he only still has 20 friends. Don't know. But uh, he didn't have hundreds and hundreds of friends on Friendster because there weren't a billion people on Friendster. Whereas Facebook had a really good rollout. And so by the time you learned what Facebook was, you probably knew someone there. And by the time you joined, they were probably telling you all about this farm that they had, that they were their virtual farm that they were farming. And it just took off right, based on network effects. 